Again, no, this is this is not swimming the channel territory. I don't know you think I have on these podcasts, Ian, but nobody's swimming the channel or climbing Everest. Trust me. <laughs> Hello, 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 and welcome back to another episode of the podcast chat. And we have a very, very special guest today, Ian. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, Good we to actually, yeah, we actually met online, didn't we? Was it how? Was it a month or so ago? Oh, but yeah, five, six weeks ago. It wasn't not wasn't very long ago. Mm. But we've met virtually a few times haven't we yeah, yeah through the chamber of commerce yeah and you were unfortunately paired with me to give you some <laughs> advice <laughs> no no i'm quite i'm quite pleased i was put paired with you <laughs> <laughs> but what was your first opinion then of me i'm interested what, 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 what was we told about me before you uh, had the meeting anything or no there was no brief just to say here's a new client because i don't think you knew anybody from the chamber did you or, or, or did you you maybe knew leslie Leslie, yeah, and Mary as well. I know Mary a little bit. Only from like online. I've never, never met them. Leslie Robinson, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she's, she's, she's a project manager. She's really on the ball, Leslie. Very, mm -hmm. very sharp. Mm -hmm. And it was nothing. It was just literally, here's, here's Adam. He wants a bit of a, some eyes to look over something. I, I can't remember what it was now. Was it? I can't just remember. Grow a business. <laughs> I, I think it probably was a business development. Yeah. And it was that. And then that's how we met. But what struck me though was that you are the spitting image of my daughter's boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully that's a good thing. <laughs> it's a good thing. It's not bad. <laughs> yeah, cool. And then obviously we spoke a couple of times with me and I said, Oh, you need to come on the podcast. Yeah. yeah. On the podcast. Yeah, yeah. And here we are. So With butterflies in my tummy. <laughs> yeah. I said are you excited, are you nervous, you're a bit apprehensive. But it'll be all good. It's not it's not too much of an interrogation, so it's fine. It's fine. It's okay. Be gentle with me. Yeah. So if you yep. introduce yourself on meeting someone for the first time, how would you how would you introduce yourself apart from hi, I'm Ian? Oh, that's, a, oh, that's, that's, a that's funny because I'm just in a transitional period at the moment mm -hmm. because I've started a new business. So I normally I've been working with the chamber now and, and in that industry for, for quite a long time. But I've been working directly with the chamber since 2017. So I'm a I'm a I'm a business advisor and consultant. So that's probably the, what I would say. You know, I work with the chamber and I advise SME businesses on various aspects, finance, whatever. whatever. Uh, but now, because I'm a, an author, I've, mm. I've I've got three books published. I'm starting. When people say to me, "What do you do?" I'm more inclined now to say, "Well, I'm a writer rather than a business person." Mm -hmm. So that's a that was a difficult question that because. Because you, you can't just say, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a business consultant and a writer. Yeah. Even though I've written about business. <laughs> <laughs> One of the other, isn't it? I suppose people get confused at that, wouldn't they? I'd imagine. Yeah. Like, yeah, what, yeah. What, a business consultant yeah. and a writer. And a writer. Yeah. So right. it's, yeah. So that's, so I'm, I'm more inclined to doing that now, saying writer and author pr before consultant, because I'm trying to move away from do doing the, the business advice to more full-time writing so it will work eventually but we there's just that transitional period yeah it? it's that in between if it isn't it? i imagine yeah. yeah see i've i've put him off the business consultancy he's trying to get into writing and off being an author now <laughs> i didn't i didn't like to blame you but there you go <laughs> <laughs> so there's just the three the three facts then the three facts then you said you struggled with these as well didn't you oh, i did yeah I, I did because i mean you could I'm obviously quite a bit older than you, so there's a number of things I, I, I could have put, but I wish it was something like I swam the channel or <laughs> <laughs> I've got a top it. of Everest, but <laughs> it's not that interesting. <laughs> I tell you what, I tell you what, one podcast I did is actually one of my clients now, Chris Smalley. He said he held the world record for alpha <laughs> alphabetizing alphabeti spaghetti in the quickest no. time. And he held the world record for three years and I think he did it in like two minutes and eight seconds and I actually believed him and I kept on asking him about it and he said I've got to be honest with you Adam I'm lying to you it's not true <laughs> <laughs> and that was within 10 minutes of me meeting him I was like who is this guy <laughs> and what was he on about <laughs> brilliant I can't I can't I can't even get to that point I, I, I think that probably the first thing that 
might surprise you is that my wife and I bought a derelict farm mm -hmm. and I did not put a plug on a kettle <laughs> <laughs> at the time. <laughs> so we, we, we bought a farm, a small holding with a few acres and, and we got down to the, we looked at it and there was, there was sheep living in the kitchen and there was, there was not even a drive to this place. And I said to Susan, it'll be fine. We'll, we'll make it work. We'll, we'll make it work. It took 30 years, but we didn't make it work. So. <laughs> but they all made you buy that thing. Oh, I don't know. You know what? I, I don't know. It was, I think it was probably so we could bring the kids up in a, in a country environment. I mean, we had a few acres, so we had strawberry, strawberry patches and, you know, I'd drive the kids around on a quad bike and swing them around on a, on a, uh, like a bad girl was tied to the back of the quad bike oh, in, yeah, in the yeah. paddock and, and, you know, they can go out and pick plums out of the tree and that, and it was that, it was giving them that, that kind of environment where they could grow up kind of encumbered in a way, except when they started getting to town, they went, oh, can we go to town? Oh, no. Miles so away. <laughs> it, was, it was 12 miles to Penrith. So my wife and I spent all weekend driving kids to some like cricket or guitar lessons or whatever. <laughs> so that backfired. That did, it did backfire. But, you know, we, 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 you know, we were there for 30 years and it was great. So, yeah. so that was the first thing, I suppose, that we took on this big job and I didn't know which end of the screwdriver to, to use or I'd never used a pickaxe or... You're quite handy now then. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I get by. <laughs> what <would> the wife say? <laughs> I was going to offer you setting up the gear, but you know, but I, I'll lift you to it. <laughs> right, the second one, the second one. Oh, I have to write this down. So, I like when people know, come prepared. Good. I like when people come prepared. Again, this is not Everest territory, but you might be surprised to know that I coached girl rugby at Penrith up until oh. up until COVID. Oh, really? Under 18s, yes. That's cool. <laughs> How did you get into that then? Well, I've always played rugby. I've always been, you know, the boys played, my boys played rugby and I, I played rugby to club level. And I played rugby. All I was interested at school was English mm -hmm. and playing rugby. And that, and, and that was it. So there was no positions really. I mean, it was only after really my younger boy went to Penrith to, to play rugby, played for the Colts and worked his way through. And one day, one of the lads who, who was coaching the girls just said to me, can you just give us a hand? He left within a few months and I, I took over. And, and now I think there's about four girls teams there now. Really? That's Whereas amazing. I think there was only one big group when I was there and there was like under 12s and we didn't get any, couldn't get any matches because we couldn't get a team together. And it's a bit, it's a bit difficult when, you, when you're coaching boys, you'd actually get down in the scrum or you can lift them up in the line out. It's a bit difficult with girls because you can't, yeah. You've got to show them and it's a bit, bit more difficult because you're not, you can't, you know, you can't touch, you can't yeah. touch them you know, you, or, or anything. So you've got to, luckily we, we did have a player from, a, a woman's player from Kendall who came for a few months. Um, maybe that just took them over the edge in terms of learning and particularly she was a forward, this, this woman, mm -hmm. and I was a forward. So it, mm -hmm. it made me, my job a bit easier to, you know, I could see that they were rooking properly and tackling properly and, Whatever, so that that like, is cool, that isn't it? Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, I would never have thought that. Yeah, because <laughs> that's the thing. Even so, I, I mainly like football, but a lot of women's sports are seem to get a bit of traction now, aren't they? And becoming more popular and more accessible for people. De definitely, particularly particularly at club level, because you know, even even the even boys that the most clubs struggle with with boys because they get to seventeen, eighteen sex, drugs and rock and roll kick in mm, and definitely. then we go to uni yeah, and usually it's away. So uh, Penrith was quite lucky. Some of the lads went to Newcastle, so they would come back and play. And, so, and, and two of my girls went to, to uni and I think one of them, one of them plays under 21s for Scotland and one for England. Oh, that's so cool, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So, but that's, that is the problem with club, club sports because they grow up and yeah. you know, they, they kind of, walk away from it which is really sad really but because mm, even like when I went to uni I was big into football and then I just stopped playing football when I went to uni because like you say you nightclubs nightlife alcohol girls and all that kind of thing yeah, unfortunately yeah but yeah so then the third fact third fact third one 
Again, <laughs> yeah, this is this is not swimming the channel territory. I don't know who you think I have on these podcasts, Ian, but nobody's swimming the channel or climbing Everest, trust me. <laughs> okay. You may be surprised to know that I've completed three degrees in the last 10 years. In the last 10 years? Yeah. Busy. How have you found time for that? Who knows? <laughs> Working full time and then... Yeah, it's it's been it's been continuous study. Why 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 would you want to do that? Then? As I said earlier about be, the writer and stuff, then it, it it's always in your favour. It in a way, if you can, if you've got some writing experience behind you when you when you're applying to literary agents or even publishers, you can public you can apply to publishers direct, and there's got to be some kind of you know, you might have written the best novel or non-fiction book in the world, and you'd be very, very lucky if they even actually opened it because they look at your bio first and they look at your experience and whatever, whatever. And if you've got no, generally, if you've got no, it's a bit like we were talking about newspapers before. Resources are very, very short in 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 this that industry now, mm. and they can't. They haven't got time to do editorial work in a way. So they want they, they want to have manuscripts land on their desk almost match fit so they, they've got very little work to do and if they get a, if they get a manuscript from you know mary from kendall who's written the best romantic novel but she's she, a she's she's got no training or b she's got no kind of i don't know other experience she's not part of a writing group or anything like that and they go oh. yeah mm -hmm. and these people these editors will receive a hundred manuscripts a day some oh, some there? of the busy ones. So, you know, you are swimming against the tide. Mm. Even if you have got a PhD in writing, really? you are swimming against the tide because, believe it or not, there's something like a million books published a year. That many? Yeah. That's a lot of books, isn't it? Yeah, it is. So it was really just to kind of elevate yourself, take yourself to the next level and stand yeah, out a bit more. Yeah, definitely, yeah. yeah. It, and, and, it, and also you, you need to learn the craft. It's like, you know, like can't put a plug on a kettle, you, you know, you've got to, you have to learn. Get in the trenches kind you, of thing. You, yeah, you do. You, you you have to learn how to, which, which the green or the red white, whether the red, red up the white goes in. Don't ask me, honestly. So, <laughs> I've forgotten. But it's the same with, with as you know, Adam, it's, 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 it's like that with any, any skill, you know, the more you do what you're doing, you know, is this your seventieth podcast? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, the more you the more you do it, the the better you get at it. Just not better at my posture. That's what we talked about before. <laughs> Need to constantly yeah, room sit too. up. I was, I was six foot when I started. <laughs> <laughs> so, what were the three degrees then? What were the three degrees? First degree was a BA honours in humanities with literature. Okay, and I'd already done a three year diploma in. So I'm not counting that in the 10 years. Oh, yeah, right. I'd already done a three year diploma in creative writing. Second was an MA. I completed in, I graduated in 15. And the third one was PhD in creative oh, writing. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah that's, okay. that's, de that's dedication. That is to be fair. That's cool. Yeah. So then let's go back to a little E and then what you're like growing up. Oh, God. What? What, well, you, what were you passionate about? Now you know where I'm from. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah. <laughs> Scouser. <laughs> Secret Scouser because he doesn't really have an accent a bit like my dad my dad doesn't really have much of an yeah, accent you, but you can tell my mum <laughs> can you really yeah. okay yeah it's it's something you work you work to, to lose <laughs> apologies to any Scousers <laughs> so yeah we were really poor mm. we, we, li we lived in Walton as I said to you early on it's and we were just poor we you know I say to the kids now when we're talking about growing up and I would say you know first up best dressed you know, because we were poor. At one point, there were seven of us sleeping in one. You, honestly, this is not the spaghetti moment. <laughs> <laughs> you might want to explain that. But <laughs> there were seven of us sleeping in one room at one point really? for a, a year or two, yeah, because, and then my mum was quite lucky. She she got a new bill somewhere, but it was tough going. Yeah. yeah. What, what what did you in, enjoy doing then when you were younger? Was there anything? Did you enjoy like the the writing or the reading yeah. or anything like that? Or yeah, when I was ten, I got my first job. Ten, yeah, really? delivering papers. Okay, um, yeah, yeah. So again, your audience will believe this is this is not a spaghetti moment. I was paid uh, ten shillings a week, which was fifty p. 
It could be a week. So delivery papers morning and night, six days a week. Mm. What's what's that to inflation, do you reckon, these days? Oh, it, well, 50p. Is that good money? Then yeah. Would be, I don't know, 20p, 30p a week. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's my own call. I'm still talking about slave labour. Yeah. yeah, I wrote my first poem when I was 11 when I went to my high school, which oh. was also also comp. Yeah, yeah. So I wrote my first poem when I was 11. Can you remember why you did that? Was it part of the, the curriculum or was it just because you wanted to do it? No, it was, they, they had, a, they had a magazine, an annual magazine called the Orsopian. Mm. And I actually found them when we moved. I really? still got ev every annual copy that I, I, that I was in. And it was just one of those things that I, I liked English. And so I wrote a poem and, and they, they put me in. Oh. It's called The Butcher's Window, I remember it. Yeah. Railing against animal cruelty, I can't remember. It was, yeah. it was something about, you know, what's all this about? You know, got dead animals in the window or something like that. Mm. So oh, I was 11. Uh, yeah, no, that's interesting. How, how did you find school then? Did you enjoy it? Like the academic side of it? Or was it mainly just like the sport and the rugby and that kind yeah, of thing? Yeah, it was. I, I was. It was only, I, I'll be honest, I only went to school to play rugby and English. I liked English literature, but all the other stuff, I think I left with like one D in geography. I think I got a, a high, I, got, I, I think I did okay in Spanish, but mm. failed everything else. And that, that, that was, that was a blow because I didn't realize I went to the junior RAF. Okay. And that was a blow because I didn't realize that you need some old levels to join the RAF. Oh, what did you need then to join the RAF? Uh, I can't remember. I think it was something like three O levels. Mm. I didn't get three O levels. And I, I remember, and I remember, never forget this moment going for, you know, it's like when you're 16, 17, you can, you know it all. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I went to the recruitment office and I, I had an appointment and I actually failed the medical as well. So really? I, yeah, yeah, my sight. Oh, okay. You can't fly planes when you're blind. blind <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense, really. <laughs> totally. I was devastated. I actually yeah. was devastated. Life over. Yeah. Yeah, so. Because like at that age, so like that is the end of the world, isn't it? Like, yeah. You so, think, oh, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to be. And then if you can't do that, you think, oh, well, what do I do now? And um, what, what did you want to do? What was the plan next? Well, I did, I'll just backtrack a little bit. Yeah, yeah. My, my hero when I was a kid, I would just lie in bed, you know, with the touch and under the pillows. And I read every single Biggles book. You maybe don't know who Biggles is. No, I was going to say, I have no idea what that is. He used to fly a Supworth camel, which was like in the First World War. Okay. And I was a little bit, I, still, I mean, I'm still romantic. And I was a little bit romantic. I didn't think I was going to fly a Supworth camel or a like biplane. Mm. But that's always what I wanted to be when I, when I right, reading the stories about Biggles and Anginol, and Anginon. Like mm. these First World guys, you know, with the going down, I'm going down in flames, you know, <laughs> the, with, the, with the scarf. <laughs> that was going to be you. And the, yeah, that was going to be me. So that, that was why I was so devastated because I had this image in my head and then I ended up going to Butlins. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. What, on a holiday or to work? <laughs> to work. To work. I worked in Butlins for two seasons. Oh, okay. That's interesting. It's a bit of a contrast from the RAF, isn't it? It was a little bit, yes. <laughs> I was still fucking by the seat of my trousers though, because I can't sing. I'm not very funny. <laughs> but what were you doing? I could entertain. <laughs> what were you doing in Butlins? I did, I did a couple of things. I, I was a red coat and mm. not a very, very bad one. When I went out, I actually went to work in the kitchen, in the dining room, and my mate went to work in the kitchen. So my job was to lay the tables. Mm -hmm. So I can imagine if, if this was in Patheli, which is in Wales, I think probably something like 500 people would come to breakfast. 500. At, at least. It was honestly, there was hundreds of tables. So it was my job to lay the tables. That's a big job, isn't it? It really? was. Particularly with all the cutlery, because it was on a, we had a tray. And all the cutlery was in this tray. It was around your neck. And there was like all this cutlery, heavy cutlery in there. Anyway, I, I, I kind of moved on from that a little bit because I, I did have a crack with the customers and mm -hmm. tell them jokes. And I won a competition actually early on. I pretended I was a guest. Mm -hmm. It was called a Topsy Turvy Contest. So I dressed up as a woman. I borrowed a dress off one of the girls and I had long, long hair then, you know, like, like here. You yeah, had to tie it back. But anyway, I dressed up as this, a woman and I won. <laughs> <laughs> so what were you doing then? Not sure what that says about it, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's so funny. So what, what were you doing then? What was the what was the competition? We just it was, it was called Topsy. It was a Topsy Turvy contest, and okay. men 
dressed up as women. Yeah, whoever looked the best. Whoever looked the best, yeah. Who, who, was, just, the, yeah. who was the best woman who was a man? I have to dig out some photos of that at the moment. I have got one. <laughs> there will be one. I have got one in, in a box upstairs. Because <laughs> when I met my wife, I was just showing her some stuff and she always oh, like, you step. So she obviously worked. Oh, bloody hell, yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so then from what was next obviously you didn't want to live not live work at Butlins all your life did you yeah. have any like jobs that you wanted to do or career path you wanted no, to take I was, I was devastated yeah. I was going to go from Butlins I actually my mate got fired uh, he got he, he got found on the women's in the women's section <laughs> <laughs> what dressed up as a woman no or? no with, with a woman <laughs> <laughs> that's alright then yeah it's not as bad <laughs> <laughs> so he got fired and uh, the next after we were finished the Butlins, we were going to go, go down fruit picking mm. into to Europe, to, to France. And uh, anyway, some of the girls I'd met, they, they'd already gone to Holland. They were working in a hotel in Holland. So they, they said, a little bit better. Like, not an email. Yeah. You know, Google and the bin invented. <laughs> that's, that's mad. I would be like, I can still do that though, isn't it? So, so I ended up going, I, would, I lived in Holland for two years. Or, yeah. I missed a bit out really because I'd I met the reason I met Henry because I met when I was working in me. The girl came in the family and told her for a week and I said to her a bit of the week, really, really, really enjoyed that. That's what she said to all of them now. Really enjoyed that. <laughs> really enjoyed <laughs> that. <time. laughs> well, what about like this? <laughs> really enjoyed our, our time together. You know, come back at, you know, come back at some point and uh, following week. <laughs> I was I was working and the office called me and said, "Oh, can you come to the to the gate?" And then she looked. The girl the girl was at the gate with a suitcase, and I take it there on your own. I mean, she got, wasn't young. <laughs> <laughs> Just had a tell you. Yeah. And it turned out I actually instead of going with my mate Ian and got fine because it was in the girl's Alex, I actually went to Holland with this girl and we worked, lived in Holland for eighteen months, two years. Ah, oh, dear. So why did she come back then? This is a bit of a charmer back in the day. <laughs> Maybe some like money. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, we did have we we got on as well. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so we were taller than then. Nearly two years later, I came home one day because she she ran the B and and I ran the warehouse for this guy. So um, anyway, we had a work in apartment in a place called Ludwig Kenze, which is really on the coast. Beautiful place. Came over one day and had a badge of package, you know, I'm here for the ball and I'm going home. Mm-hmm. So I said, okay. So I uh, packed my bags and ended up in Penrith. Really? Yeah. That's crazy. Because so, what was Holland like then? Oh, I, was, I loved it. I loved it. And I learned a lot in Holland about business. I worked for a gentleman called Manier de Bois, who he was absolutely a one off. He was these slug cigars with a bowler hat and really, really. Strange guy, but he had businesses all over the place, and he had an interesting fact. And this is probably not a good thing; it wouldn't happen now. But there was a boat sunk in in Amsterdam, a cargo boat, and he bought all the cargo off the boat that got to the bottom of the sea, and he had pallets and pallets of canned carrots and peas, probably rusting in the on these pallets and I was in choice of the warehouse and all these loads of pallets and he just he bought them for nothing and he made an absolute fortune the cans were rusty but I think everything in the cans were okay so anyway I worked for him for 18 months I think because the job I went to do originally I got fired yeah from so that's interesting isn't it yeah because I suppose you can make money for anything kind of yeah. Yeah. he was a sharp cook he was many and Really, really good business. Yeah, yeah. I learned. I learned a lot from it. Yeah. So then, when you went back to Penrith, what what what, 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 what kept you out of trouble then? Well, there used to be. Oh, I said, yeah, in Penrith, there's a um, cash and carry. Mm-hmm. I can't remember what it's called now. But when I came to Penrith, it was called GW Collins. So I need to get a job, obviously. I saw this job advertised at Herald, and it was something like what was it called? It was warehouse. Oh, what was it? It was something like warehouse building, something like that. And this is the can't put a plug on a kettle. So I thought, well, I could probably bluff my way through this. Mm-hmm. So I applied for this job, a warehouse assembler. That's what it was. 
So I went to see a guy called Sam Sabots and I, I, I was interviewed for an hour on the basis about building warehouses, assembling warehouses, and he offered me the job. I thought, show me, but I haven't even got a plug. I haven't got a not a shovel or a pick. <laughs> but it turns out a warehouse assembler was working in the warehouse, assembling people's orders to go and work in. And that's just like a pack ticker <laughs> and a pick. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a fancy name. <laughs> Anyway, so I had the dream. Yeah. So I worked for seven years. Seven years? Yeah, long time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Some of my houses. But yeah. But you didn't learn too much, did you? No. Well, I, I didn't. I, I actually got promoted. But, but I went to work in the sales department. Mm. So that's my my first proper job in business development. Oh, okay. Because that's the one thing I wish I did, but I didn't get, get a sales job. Mm. So I've never done that. I feel like it'd be a good skill to have all the... Because I think I'm quite good at marketing, something, but I'm not very good at selling it. Yeah, yeah. it's different. People, people get them mixed up as well. I've written a book about business development and so oh, you said that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> read it. <laughs> but I'd, yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd, you're right. And I think good salespeople have to go through that baptism of fire mm. where when they normally start, they normally start in the tele sales department. Yeah. So they're making cold call, like they do cold calls or make appointments for the big boys. Yeah. Let's go and see. And you need that, you need that background to, 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 to yeah. get on in sales. Because one thing I was self-reflecting, if you can call it, I hate like them kind of words, but I was thinking basically the other day that I have done sales when I was at uni and when I finished, I worked at events, like night club events. And you see, well, I don't know if you know, but like we'd go around halls of residences, banging on people's doors saying, what are you doing tonight? You can't mm-hmm. say I'm like club, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. That kind of thing. So that's like literally knocking on doors. Other people have said they've knocked on doors and sell. So like like and shirts and stuff. But we've just sold oh, that. Did you? Nightclub tickets and that. Mm-hmm. So, so I have done it in one kind of way, but it's not really like, it was never scripted. It was never trained. It was just like, go knock on the door, see where they go. Get them to come to our nightclubs, get them to buy tickets and that kind of thing. But was there a call to action? Not, not, not. Yeah, buy the tickets off me. No. No. Right now, for this yeah. second. And you get 10% of this here. Yeah, or you or get a free, yeah, free, yeah, free VIP and bottle of bubbly. That's what I've done. Yeah, so I was thinking the other day, I think he'd put that. That's my sales stream. If I'm in on uni student stores and get it, you've got to start somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, crazy. So, yeah, so what, what was next after that then? Oh, I'll skip through these. Um, yeah. So, I got promoted again, which is this linked to what I did when I left the corporate world. Mm. If we get back on, if we don't do that time. You've got plenty of time, don't you? We're oh, okay. So I actually worked in as a, as a catering sales guy. So I, what, it was a great job. I, I drove around the Lake District and I went to all the hotels and restaurants selling them food or raw materials like, you know, flour and sugar and I met all the restaurants, owners, I met all the, I met all the chefs and it, it was a fantastic job. Good and network. It was yeah. fantastic. I really loved that job. Yeah. Yeah. Did you use the North Lake to sell? It, no, I think that would just came on stream and I'd moved to another job at that point. But I can hear you a little anecdote if you want about it. Because I got, I got really friendly with the staff at Levy House. Well, it was a proper, it was a really top restaurant. And I got really good mates with the chef. I've been going out, I've been going out with my, my wife for quite, quite some time. So I thought I was going to propose to her. So I got the whole building lined up. So when I, so they cooked what I asked them to cook in the kitchen. The waiters and waiters were brilliant. They managed to get the, the drawing room empty for me to take coffee and an eau de vie in, in, in the drawing room. And I got down on one knee with the box. Yeah. And all the staff were at the door behind me. I said, Susan, will you marry me? Yeah. And she went, no. Yeah. <laughs> she said, no, I swear to God. I said, what? <laughs> This is not another spaghetti dog. <laughs> <laughs> what she said no? She said no, yeah. Why did she say no? I think because I took her by surprise. We did. We did. Obviously, got married later. Yeah, I was going to say. 
Like, what? That's crazy. I mean, you must have felt terrible, though, did you? Yes. Well, I was with 12 people sitting really in the drawing room. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, that would have been so awkward for them as well. Oh, they did. Well, she, 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 she couldn't see them because she went back to the back to the drawing room. Oh, right. And they're all going to see them. They're all, they're, they're all like this one. <laughs> and, I, and I went, <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Your heart was in a sand car. Like these girls devastated. <laughs> Again, it was another look getting in the RF moment. <laughs> oh my God. So, I just want to know how how did you like pull yourself out of that situation? Once you get back and forth one day and then go your separate ways? Or? No, well, I had to buy a cigarette because we were just leaving the house. Just leaving the house. I've never seen you again. This is in, in, in fact, now I wasn't going to mention that, but now we mentioned it, we actually spent it for a year. After that, okay. After a year. And then we got back together again. Yeah. And then I'll I'll be after. And then after. Yeah. I'll be back since. So, but I just thought, <laughs> should you make you smile? Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of funny. So then you said, did you want to go to how you got into the corporate world? Or what? Well, I, yeah, I did. I, from that, from college, is, yeah. I joined HP Phones, a really big big chip company. Yeah. I did an IT degree. Oh, no. Then I made to my. Worked for Renault. Okay. So he advertised a job, but again, I didn't get a job. But he ran me a year later. You know, it, this is a great recruitment technique, by the way. The, the Renault put an advert in the Telegraph. That's how it worked then. Still not been good, I don't think. And 600 people applied for this job and they got it down to 60. And what they, what they, I don't think they do it now, but what they did, they invited all 60 shortlist people to a hotel at the same time. Yeah, brilliant. So they get you in a room, they break you. So I was, that group was 60, so they broke, broke us down into three twenties, give everybody coffee, brought the first 20 into a, into a room, and it's boardroom style. And they said, right, you're not here for a job. You've actually been left two million pounds by a relative in Australia. We were, wow. So what we want you to do is work out what you're going to do with the money, and how you're going to split it up, and how you're going to, you know, how you're going to work together to do it. And then there's three sales managers in the room who are walking around the table with their. They've obviously got a matrix. Well, they have got a matrix. I did it myself later. They've got a matrix in there, and they just picked up everybody's name and just made comments in the little box by people who were getting engaged in the conversation or taking, you know, taking over the conversation or making like, you know, suggesting things or whatever. And then they bring the next 20 in and then the next 20, and then they've got a short list of 20 then. So they said at the end of that, that and it's only about 20 minutes or 30 minutes each group. So they get all the 60 back in the room again and go, right, look, this is no reflection of you, but we've got a short, we've got a short list. We've got to get down to somebody that with a specific thing we're looking for. So if you get a tap on the shoulder, it doesn't mean to say, you have done well, but you don't fit our profile. Yeah. So then they can dance 20. And then there's a whole host of things that they do then. They'll, they'll do, so you become a pet salesman and you, you, you have to go and see a client who's got the rock pins from the last order. And you've got to leave without taking them back. And all, all those kind of techniques till the final three at 10 o'clock at night. One day. Yeah. Were you down to the last three? I was down to the last three. And I, I'll never forget it. It was a guy called Nicole. I sound from this other guy, but I'd spend a lot of time with Nick the other day. We got on really well. He was from Sheffield. And I did a really clever cool thing. They said to you at the very bit of a Columbo moment, just when you, you know, they said, I didn't do like a one to one personal interview, a couple of directors and somebody from France. And, like and then they go, right, okay, thanks. And just as you get a oh, just one other thing. If you don't get the job, who do you think should get the job? It is a. And, I, and it takes you by surprise to the Nicole. And the other guy said, Nicole. Oh, I said, Nick got it. So Nick got the job. Oh. Nine minutes later, the guy rang me and said, Nick didn't work out. He's coming out of London and had a one to one interview. I'd better go to John. Oh, no, no, no. That's interesting. I've, I've, done, I've had one similar experience. Really? really? When I was finishing uni, I would say working for the North Plates of Town Spa. I think I did hospitality management at uni. And did like a general assistant and got duty manager experience. And then I was going to work for their hotel group. 
but then I turned that down because I didn't think it was a big group. No, I'm not. Daniel for each group. So it's the trend. Yeah, the trend. But I just thought with the experience I had in Leeds Uni, they weren't offering me what I wanted. So I was like, no, I don't do that. So then I applied for Marriott Hotel. Yeah. And then they had three jobs in Scotland, at Aberdeen, Edinburgh, and Glasgow. Yeah. yeah. So they did an assessment day. So everyone applies. And they wheeled it down to like 20, 25 people. Similar thing, whole day. And then you go in different, put in different scenarios, yeah. see how you yeah. do. And they do the one on one interviews and speed interviews, interview each other and that kind of thing. And there's only three jobs. Yeah. And these people getting flown over from like Paris, Barcelona, better unis than me because I went to Cardiff Met, not like the Cardiff Uni, because I'd worked in the North Lakes for like two years. Yeah. Yeah, amazing experience. I was better than everyone else. Well, technically. Yeah. 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 Um, and so then I I was like, oh, well, I'm going to IB on a holiday in like a couple of days. And then they rang me and I was like, these saying, oh, you've got one of the jobs in Aberdeen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and there's another trip over down the way. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> because the hotel manager wouldn't really like me yeah. and what I was good. But then I turned that down because I was like, I'm going to go to Aberdeen. Yes. Me and my dad went up and had a look round, showed it round, and I was thinking, no, nah, this isn't for me. And that's when I went back down to car and do events. Okay. Well, you didn't need a course of events. No. So, long story short, I went to uni to do hospitality yeah. events. Yeah. Oh, and events. Ah. Well, then I dropped, so then I dropped events. Yeah. I dropped yeah. events after a year. Yeah, yeah. I was still working for nightclubs. Yeah. And then I was doing my own events, and then I was working in the hotels. But then that was going to be my graduate thing but then part of the hotels to yeah, work for the events company and they yeah. sell me yeah. events and more yeah. that's a bit like that makes sense yeah. Yeah. yeah but yeah these definitely are good though I think aren't they well yeah do you know what I was with other people and you can size them up or anything yeah, yeah. I, I was I worked with a client last year I don't tell you who it is mm-hmm. but they were just recruiting a new marketing person yeah so they on a zoom they were from the old scheme so I had them for 12 hours I had them for 12 hours so they were doing this recruitment and I said, well, I tell you what we used to do. And I told them, not necessarily all that, that story the way I've told it there, but I explained how the system worked and went, that is absolutely brilliant. Yeah. And they did it and they, they narrowed it down to one marketing lady and they loved it. They loved the way it worked. They tweaked it a little bit with their own flavour. If you yeah, you've got to have more. Yeah, yeah. Every business is different, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think it's good, isn't it? Putting, it's not like... But it's putting people on the spot, isn't it? In any different situations, scenarios, yeah. because I feel like anybody can interview well, can't they? You can make it up as you go along, you can lie, write lies or whatever, and you tell the poor kids. And, and also, if you do your research well, you know, you know, you know who the chief exec is and you know what the turnover was last year and how much profit they made. Yeah. But you, you find that on the web. You see, yeah. Uh, but it's, it's, I would say about my son, Ruben, if he gets in front of a, well, he's, Apply for a job and he gets in front of the HR people or whoever, he always gets the job. Yeah. Because he's got the personality and he, he can do that kind of bullshit. Not, not, not bold bullshit, but little bullshits. Yeah. It's just like, you know what to say, yeah. your mannerisms and stuff like that, isn't it? Yeah. And I don't know if any job he's applied for, you looked up. Yeah. I mean, I haven't applied for many jobs, but I'd be similar. And like, say, when I went to apply for the North Lakes placement, you think? Wrong with it now. I'm like, yeah, yeah. the other jobs and the Marriott and stuff like that. And I think it's just, you just know what to say and you know what to do, don't you? But and also, still research those other things. Oh, no, no, stuff. definitely. That's pretty key. That's that's the main building block. Yeah. You know, you can't go in there and you don't know who you're talking to. <laughs> yeah. But I'd also said to my, my kids, you know, people respect loyalty, hard work, commitment. And if they can see that in the interview, you know, anybody can put that in the in the CV or whatever. But if they can see it in your eyes when you're seeing the wipes in their eyes, if they can see you, I think if they're a good HR person or a good employer, they'll know. Yeah, bullshit. And they'll know somebody who will go that extra mile. And that's more important, I think. In, in, as a small business owner, I want to employ people who are going to work hard, particularly after we left the corporate world and went into what I was going to say about hospitality. Yeah. Like, you know, that, so that catering experience, I had talked to, you know, working with the chefs, 
was fighting and what I was doing when I left the corporate world. Yeah. And, you know, when you're talking to people who, are, who think they applied for a crap job because it's a waiter or a waitress or a barman, people that still think it's a proper job and it's a really, really valuable job. It's important, yeah. Of hospitality. Dealers. Well, hospitality is 25% of the, the gross income of Cumbria. Is it? Oh, yeah, no, I never knew that. Yeah, farming's twenty five percent, hospitality twenty five percent, and the other fifty percent is split over, you know, arts, manufacturing. But it's as big as farming, hospitality, well, you, it makes sense, really, isn't it? Isn't it? Like district, isn't it? Really. So you know, being a waiter, a, 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 or a barman, or or even a Porsche, it's a really, really important job to keep that wheel spinning, that clock turning inside the organisation because it's a vital part of. Providing that customer experience that you just said, and, and it's really important. Yeah. People think it's it's just a. Oh no! To be fair, often it is. They just think it's just a stepping stone. Not many people make a career after being a waiter. Yeah, not really being a millionaire, you know, like, unless you're in LA. It's still close <laughs> because Tim's. <laughs> the I I got across only the guy in the bar in um, Santa Monica because we we stayed there for two weeks. And the guy lived in what well, Hollywood. Yeah. The guy had a house in Hollywood. Really? Well, every time you buy a beer, beer's three quid. You've got to give him a dollar, three dollars. You have to give him another dollar as a tip. Yeah, I need to move. <laughs> think about it. <laughs> From now in Korea. <laughs> but yeah. I, think, I think the hotels. I was glad I worked in hotels yeah. when I did because you learned so much. Like to say about the cooks, I started off being like a porter and then went into the kitchen a couple of weeks and did the. Uh, Restaurant, they did the bar, they did housekeeping and reception and all that kind of thing. You realize how all the departments work in synergy and you need yes. each one to work together. And I think that for me, reception is one of the most important, if not the most important, because you're dealing with that customer's first impression of you're given. Yeah. So if you're just sitting in the back on your phone or you're like, I'm going to around. The thing, the thing, let's see, why don't I pay all this money for this hotel? Yeah. So you've got to be, uh, yeah. but like I say, everything's important because you want it, especially if, like when I was in four star hotel and spa, it's an experience for the people, isn't it? Yeah. Spending a bit of money, yeah, and it's quite a lot of money because it's my perception is it's like an attainable luxury because people can save up and go to a four stars without mm. a hotel, can't they? Anybody can, yeah. and yeah. so. They want it to be nice, they want to remember it and stuff, and, and yeah, so, yeah, I've definitely done a lot. Yeah, I mean, it has changed the bit for it. I, I actually ran my own restaurants and put small hotel and bars and whatever from about 2010, and I think expectations have risen dramatically since then. In general, not, not of those pubs on the pubs that wheel, but in general, people's expectations have, have gone up, so you've got to be even more in your game now. Why do you think that is, sir? Well, I don't think it's any. I don't even think it's anything to do with COVID. I mean, things have got up. Um, time for media, maybe, and, you know, and social media. Thinking everything's got to be. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, it's possible. I'm just, I'm just writing another book about that kind of that kind of influence on on society in general, and definitely social media is a big influence on on most things. And you know, I think it's like with maybe chip advisor, maybe. Yeah. Which is social media, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah. And that's maybe how the, the expectations have risen because people are, are influenced by each other. I'm not personally, but you know, if, if I see a restaurant and I want to go and visit, I, I don't even go to the bars now. But you're you know, a, a reviewer. Well, well, you are. Well. And if you can read between the lines and there's 99 reviews and three of them go, oh, well, the ham was too salty. Is the worst place ever. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's, it's more authentic. I think if you're going to get a bad review, you can't be perfect all the time, is it? But, but as a original tour, you're only good as you're here, fortunately, and you, you you've got to keep on top of your game constantly, twenty four seven. I think it's true that I should have because when I was working at the North Lakes, the GM no, all this not the dark pretty yeah, no, pros just yeah. like getting, oh, that if you need to I think it's quite fun. I just set up until three o'clock and rolling the plan to check the visor. And then, yeah. It's not cleansing. However, after a few years, I had the odd person come in and I'd maybe be in the kitchen or for whatever, and somebody comes through and again, somebody just come in and ask you specifically. Oh, yeah. One guy in particular, the first one that came in, he went, Do you mean? Yeah. 
it's a, you've made my holiday this week. Because I've laughed, I had laughed so much. Oh. We trip advising. Uh, <laughs> but your response is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's so, what you want now. So how, how is your audience growing every podcast or? Slow and steady, like mainly for me. I'm not that bothered about if the podcast grows or not. It's mainly just for me at the moment, just for networking. Yeah. So it's just like a, a way in to speak to business owners that I wouldn't be able to speak to normally. But it, 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 it grows slow and steady, you know what I mean? Like it depends how big the audience is of the other person. We'll pick a, a good one that I did was with um, a local funeral director, Jill Glencross. And she's quite particular. Keep quite a bit from her, to be fair. But yeah, the, at the moment, it's mainly just like a marketing tool. In the yeah. Whereas um, I've thought about like getting podcast sponsors and stuff like that, but don't really need the money for it at the moment, but I would like it to self-sustain itself. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be less organic that way, but it's just, I like it because mm -hmm. it's like a hobby. Well, I think worse though, the much of the podcast than then suddenly there's just sponsored by VPN or Viagra yeah. or whatever. It's, yeah. I, mean, I think it's okay at be the beginning and the end. Yeah. You don't want to put you off. No, and it's quite, I quite like to do, say, local businesses. Mm -hmm. If they're like, if they want to support me personally and I want to help them just like, because I mean, we get about 500, 700 views on YouTube and download downloads a week, right. which is all right. Yeah, yeah. Especially for a local one, and don't get me wrong, not everybody still quite listens to it. But if it's like, I don't know, Jill got across three with that, blah, 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 blah. And it's just like a little promo for them and they can give back, but I don't know. I need to think about that. Right. So, more technical difficulties, but we are back. So, where do you want to go from here? <laughs> what should we leave us? For a little We're talking about the hospitality industry and your hotels and your trip advisor. Yeah. And I, I think we'd maybe come to the end of that. Yeah. I think, I, I think the, the message there was, oh, it was such a week. It was a touchy, yeah. Uh, yeah, you're right. Social media is definitely a big influence on everybody and, and some of it's good and some of it's bad. And I think, I think from a bad point of view, it makes people lazy. Yeah. Because they only read the strap line and then they make a decision on on the content. It's only when they click inside the you know, what the podcast store or this Facebook post or whatever and actually read it or whatever. That's the true value. But most people don't they literally just make a decision on that strap line. You know, climate change is killing the world. And then when you click on it, there's actually nothing in there that's they don't already know. It's all for the clicks, though, isn't it? Mm. And on the news, there's never any good news either, is there? It's always negative. <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and it's getting worse. I think I said, John, I'm going to do a, I'm going to do a PR campaign over the next few weeks, and hopefully that is a good news story that they'll pick up and there will be a little bit of good news about what I'm doing. But I think 90% of the news in the paper or the TV or whatever it is. TV used to be, start with a, start with a good a good story and with a good story. Yeah. Like a bit of a shit sandwich, but yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a shit, shit sandwich. And now there's not even a good story at, at the end of local white border or whatever. It's, I think it's really certain just getting miserable, are we? And, uh, and my mum watches the news a lot and I always say to her, are you watching the news all the time? It's always negativity. Yeah. And that's the one thing I do like about social media is the fact that me personally, I follow who I want to follow and I uh, use the yeah. YouTube videos or Twitter, or whatever, yeah. Yeah. and think, oh, that may be reliable information. I'm going to take that or I'm going to take that over a pinch of salt, but I don't think everybody does that because they maybe just consume what they're being told and it may not necessarily be true. And like, say, the strap line, when you read the article, you think, that's nowhere near what you're all about. Yeah, no, it's true. And I think I think if you balance your reading now, and I uh, have this again, I have this discussion with, with my kids. You know, as students, you can imagine how, you know, we were at loggerheads of them. But I, I said to them, you need to widen your reading material. It's no good just reading The Independent or The Guardian or whoever, whoever, that influencer, because you just end up in the echo chamber. Yeah. You have to get the other side of the story. Mm -hmm. And you know that from what you do. You, you, you have to get it in, in life. Because if you're making decisions on one article about your philosophy about something it ain't gonna work. 
Now, and I've got a good example of that. Basically, there's these two influencers that are having a boxing match soon, next month. Oh, I think I know who they are. Yeah. But it's Logan Paul and oh, Little Nasdaq and KSI and Tommy Fury. No, I was the Elon Musk. They're not there. Not there. Every guy from Facebook. Yeah. And then Mark took about. Yeah. But basically, that Logan Paul put a, a snippet on of the other guy, Dylan Dallas, of their face off and him like stumbling his words and that kind of thing. And, Oh, him coming, coming across really bad, but when he watched the Thor face off interview, the other guy comes up really well. Oh, so that's, that's oh, what yeah. I mean. So, like, everyone's so really thinks, Oh, yeah, I'll face off. Really, he comes off quite well. So, it's like, so I mean, but I'll go through a bit as well. I'll see, like, with the snippet and think, Oh, yeah, because I can't go to kick onto the yeah, article yeah. and stuff. But then when you do click on the articles or full videos, I think, Oh, yeah, mm-hmm. most different. The thing, thing is, that uh, people haven't got the time, that's part of the problem. Yeah, because you your ah, so your life is constantly streamed to in from every device from every direction, and people haven't got the time to read every single thing, and that's the problem, you know. And and even just TV wise, if you think there's I don't know how many channels there are, there's hundreds of them. They've got to make content for that. They've got to attract their their own customer base, and it's 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 a it's a jungle out there. Yeah. Everywhere in terms of trying to get your message over, but I don't feel. And also, it boils down to what you're interested in. Yeah, a lot of stuff I don't even look at. Yeah, because you're in a different kind of sphere or mm-hmm. America, ecosphere or whatever, different world and stuff. So you often can see different content than I. Yes, you can. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and like I said about them boxing matches, <laughs> you don't have any clue that I know all <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I had the wrong play. I was thinking, you know, Musk and Mark Oh, that's funny. So then, yeah, so the hotels, did you enjoy that then? That, how, many, how many years did you have hotels? Right, years. Loved it. From 2010 ish to about 2011. Uh, 2018. Yeah. We saw the first one at the end of 17 and we saw the second one at the, end, at the beginning of eight. Sorry. We saw the first one at the end of 17, December. We saw the other one in January 18. Yeah. Okay. And there was, it was two restaurants, two bars, and a small hotel with the bathroom rooms. So I loved it. Uh, at the beginning, I did. But I think you know about my son. This is he, unfortunately, he was. He's, he was killed by a drunk driver and he was part of the business. So he was a big, big driving force. You know, he could cook. You know, he was all over the place. He was an electrician. He helped me with all, <laughs> all, like, the, all, the, all, the, all the plugs. All the plugs. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a huge gap in the business. And I lost the plot. Not the most of you. I absolutely lost the plot. And I didn't, I didn't. Going in one of the businesses for three years, I just couldn't. I can't confess it. Because yeah. he lived in that business, in an apartment above one of the businesses. Mm-hmm. Couldn't face it, and um, that was that was the the demise of it. Really, and I knew then that I needed to sell the businesses to move on, which is why I went to work for the bus. At the same time as we had the businesses, I was also working for the chamber doing my MA. And, uh, and I set up a financial, commercial finance business, which is how you've come to me because of like commercial experience, I think. I think that was really part of what Leslie was thinking about. I don't know. <laughs> it wasn't a business development, but I think there's a bit of finance. Yeah. I don't know. So, and that, I loved it. I absolutely loved waiting on tables and pulling pints and I pot washed. I did everything that was, I loved it. It was great. Yeah. It's part of the fun though, isn't it? Yeah. I don't know, like the staff would have respected you more knowing that you do. Every job as well. I, I hope so, yeah. And 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 you get yeah, you're right. And I think you get more from them as well. You know, they they see me mowing the lawn or the garden. It was a big garden, a big garden. One of them. It was a weekly job, but I didn't do it all the time. I did it once, or twice. It's the worst for you to do. But I, I showed Willie. I know. Yeah. I'm thinking people if people see you pot washing or I did starters at one point. I couldn't do what the chefs do. They they. They would turn out 200 meals on a Saturday night in one, in one, in one venue. It's intense, isn't it? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I couldn't do that. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. So, yeah, and I loved it. I loved it. I loved talking. And I would remember people. Mm. I would remember people, like, people come every year from a little bit that there, wouldn't they, as well? You know, they'd come in and go, oh, you're the duckman. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you know? 
I'm getting crazy, but yeah, but you, I remember you and your wife had, your wife had fish and chips or that, whatever. Yeah. And they were, yeah, yeah. Often couldn't remember the names, but I can remember what the faces, uh, face, faces and what they've eaten, yeah. That's good. Because guests would love that though, because I remember like when they were the hotel and like the head of the restaurant remember like little things like that. And it's like, oh, my God, Brené, he was called yeah. Brené, yeah. and he was French. And it, just, it just adds a little bit to the experience, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Because people want to be remembered. People want to, maybe not know they've made an impact, but they want to know if, it special. makes it feel special, then, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're going away from home, spending all this money. They want to be made to like the VIP yeah. million dollars and that kind of thing. So then, when, when did you start writing your first book then? Um, um, when was that? Or, or what was that for? The first book was published in 19, 2019. Yeah, yeah. That, that was after your son. Is that about your son? No, that, that's, that's, that's going, that's getting published on the 4th of October. Oh, that's that one. Yeah. 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 It's, it's a memoir, and it's about, it's actually, it's, the degree I did was, it's called autoethnography, and it's basically, you use yourself as the case, and you build around that with other people, say you've lost a child, in, in my case, but it's anything. You know, one of my lecturers did a thesis on on percussion. He was a drummer, and he wrote it from an autoethnographic point of view, I interviewed all the drummers in Liverpool because I was at the Uni of Liverpool. Oh, okay. Uh, well, yes. I remember went to Uni of Liverpool. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But my poet did. We were at Uni at the same time. Oh. Really, really weird. A Uni went out. I feel I walked. Well, it's not the guy you talk to. It's what happened. So, so, it, I, I, it's, so what I've done, I've extracted all the, the more personal stuff from my degree and put it into a it's novel-esque, so it reads like a book now as opposed to thesis. Oh, okay. So that, that's what's coming out on the 4th of December called Smiler. It'll be on Amazon soon. 4th of October. 4th of October. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Oh, that's cool. So then, 2019, what was the first book then? That was the awesome power of questions. That uh, I sent yeah, you the second edition. Yeah, yeah. So I had a bit of feedback on that from the first edition, which was purely about business. Mm-hmm. So it was about the sales process from telesales run through to consultative selling and growing the business, you know, upselling. So when they covered the start of the sales process right through to the very rear end, and they had about, it's got about 500, if you've looked at it, yeah, it's got yeah. about 500 questions in there. So I haven't read all 500, though. No, just, just, <laughs> <laughs> no mate, if you do. Yeah, no, the, the thing that I did take is you, you said focus on the ROI, wasn't it, from the last yeah. call? Yeah. And that's actually like, so seen a higher response rate in like the, the messages really like, from saying the same messages and saying these people have seen a I say four hundred percent four hundred percent ROI from our services. Yes. Those Lauren buys what is it? Yeah, crazy amount. Yeah. Good man. Mm. So that yeah, so so it, uh, and that's why I wrote I wrote it because since since Dominic's accident I've always I've been trying to give something back in a way, but Based on what I can do, you know, to me, I mean, but the other, the other two books I've written that are also on Amazon are about grief. So the first one was aimed at kids and it's written in the relevant, you know, in the appropriate language for, for children and it's, in, it's for kids who have lost a pet. So how, how their parents deal with it, with the child. So it's between four and 11, the, the age group. So, you know, we lost, we, we inherited Dom's dog after his accident, and we lost it about a few months ago. And that kind of cemented the book for me because we had been through the experience as well then. So that was the first one. And it's just, it's like a journal. It's, it explains in simple language for the kid. If, if they can't read, then it's simple language for the mum to talk to the dad or the guardian to say, no, this is what death is. You know, this is why you're feeling because Fido's not here anymore. This is why you're feeling it. This is what grief is. But then it's a journal and it's, there's a hundred questions in that book for the, if the child can read and write for them to sit down on their own and there's a page per question. So they can either draw a picture in the book about a Fido or the cat or whatever and all they can answer the question, which is, and it might start with some like, so how did you feel when the first came up to your family? So it's bringing out the, the emotions, the feelings and 
And eventually, it, it, it starts to make them feel a bit more normal about Greece yeah. because they've got their emotions out there. And the second one's very similar. We're saying that I've also lost a child. Yeah. But the sudden funny question that it's a bit more grown up, obviously. It's kind of talked about more stuff. You know, the questions are things like, will I ever feel joy again? Or, and there's, you know, there's, so I, I address those questions at the beginning of the book, which is the first half of the book and the second half is the journal with the symbolic processes with the children with, with, with the pets. So yeah, so those, those are the, those are the, that's cool. Yeah. Because had you always wanted to like book him or? Found a good gym. Yeah. While I was flying the plane. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, 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 I think everybody's got a book. Yeah. You, know, you might want to do my podcasting or yours. Not a role in technical difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. You've got enough memory on your laptop. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, well, that, that's part of the book, isn't it? That's, yeah. that's what actually happened. So, if you don't make any mistakes, then you never learn, do you? No. This is true. Mm. So, yeah, I've always wanted to write and that's the same about my first poem when I was 11. Yeah. And that's, we asked me, think about look, weaknesses and strengths. strengths. And, oh, look, the question before that, I think, was... Any mistakes? Or any mistakes? Yeah. Or all this regret. Is, yeah. Biggest regret is that I didn't carry on writing. I stopped writing when I was about 21. Yeah. Because, you know, sex and drugs and rock and roll come along as you play, you play rugby. Yeah. And you get involved in stuff. And I was a married wife. And one thing another, there and converted a house that I didn't ask to... <laughs> <laughs> so that's that, that is probably one of my biggest regrets is not fighting. So that's yeah. a good question. So then obviously when you left it at twenty one and got why did you pick it up in twenty nineteen, do you think what, what was the I, mean, well, I don't really picked it up because I started I did my I realised I'd left school with zero qualifications yeah. and while I was working I did an IT degree or started an IT degree. And I moved from, from the car company to, into IT. I was with the BT. And that started me on the re-education, thinking, actually, I've missed a lot here. Yeah. I obviously wasn't ready when I was 16 or 17 to learn. And that's what I started to do. And then my next course was the humanities of my diploma in creative writing. Yeah. And that's what got me back on the path in about 2010. Yeah. So in a way, I started writing then. Yeah. But- Book wasn't great just yet, was it? Yeah. So this is one of them things, isn't it? Like I feel like when people leave school, mm-hmm. a lot of people stop exercising the brain. Yeah. Do they? Totally. I use the analogy all the time, like when you go to the gym, you exercise your muscles to get them bigger, better, stronger, last longer. Whereas like the same you need to exercise your brain, don't you? Yeah. You can, yeah, you can assume information, knowledge, whatever it may be, books, podcasts, audio books and, and that kind of thing. So yeah, it's interesting. Because then when you went back to do the diploma then, was that in your mind then thinking, I want to write a book? Or yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, just I, did, I did, I did do it. I'd actually bought a novel. Oh. I, I've got 10 books on the shelf. So I've not, well, I haven't now because I've put a screen 34. So I've got six books on the shelf. Gathering dust in high cloud that I just need to polish up. And uh, so the first book I actually wrote was, it's called 100th. Mm. And it's about a black kid who, in Manchester, who uh, he's escaped, he's escaped a skateboarder, and I spoil the end. <laughs> he becomes an Olympic skier. Oh, really? uh, and the, all the trials and tribulations and the racism and the classism and all the stuff that you can imagine a black kid in that environment. Yeah, because he don't see Afro Afro Americans on the ski slopes. No. I don't know if you see, I, I, I do. No, I, 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 the thing is, I, I wish I did when I was younger, but when I was younger, I played football, football for yeah. Carlo and Johnny. Don't go see Because you might get something better. But it's, you know, it, it's actually a fact that it's a very, very closeted environment in a way. Mm-hmm. And a black kid to break into that environment is, is very, very unusual. I think when I did my research, I did my research on, which I think was it? I can't remember now, but in the whole Olympics, was in, was in Korea, South Korea. It was the one before that. I can't remember. There was only seven black competitors in the whole of the Olympics of skiing, skate, all the way to the Olympics. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Which is a shame. Yeah. That's yeah. mad. It's, you know. Where's Jim Lewis? I don't worry about this. Probably, it was a way, if you look at NFL, 
There's not very many like this. No, there's not. No, even like a lot of footballers these days. Yeah, I look at like I know Crystal Palace. They're most of their players are black. And are they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, okay, I'll probably no. kind of ten out of the eleven of them at the start this year. It's crazy. So I can't answer that question. So I had that. I just don't know. It's quite extensive, maybe. You know, that might be as fact. Yeah. Particularly for my for my character, he was a poor kid. Yeah, and I moved in the, to the Milpock. Yeah, I hold it back. So let's talk about your book coming out on the 4th of October. So that will be... Sorry. So, so I have to decide we're on this podcast. So the 4th is the... Uh, Wednesday, yeah? It, yeah, it will be. Um, okay. Okay. So yeah, that's on the 1st of the 8th. So let's let's talk a bit about that then. So if people are, are watching or listening, yeah. who who would this book be for? Who do you think is the right person to, to read the book? The audience. Yeah. And tell us a bit about it as well. Okay. So... The, the, the context as well would be quite good. Did you obviously get any more context on it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Don, Don was killed by a drug driver in 2013. And unless you know, it's an indescribable experience when you lose a child because it's not normal. It's not, you know, it's the wrong way around. Yeah, you should yeah. never have to. Yeah. 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 So, it, so the book... Has come out of my PhD as I had to try to maybe explain before about using my my case as the the hub of the of the thesis and what I did I read a lot of grief memoir so people like Julian Barnes who wrote Levels of Life great book by the way Just the Hawk by Helen MacDonald so I read up C.S. Lewis classic he wrote the first book on grief really or his journey, his journey through grief. Another great book, C.S. Lewis. And I've read, honestly, Adam, I wrote thousands, I've read thousands of psychology articles and papers, and philosophical articles and papers. And basically, I've boiled it down and, and married my story to, to the, 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 the history of grief and how it maps against people's experience. And there is light at the end of the tunnel. Because when you happened, you think there's no way out of this. Mm-hmm. And the story, I think the story, and it is now a story as opposed to a uh, thesis, the story is actually there is light at the end of the tunnel. There is hope. You can overcome most things in your life. And, you know, I've, I've just started my P- PR campaign and gone to BBC and ITV and the strap line is from pulling pints to PhD. Yeah, it's quite catchy. So, and that's precisely what I've done. Yeah. Because I didn't have a level, a level, yeah. when I'm at school, kind of thing. So it's about, it's about resilience. It's about, but it's a story as well, because it's, I'm a scout, so it's a little bit funny, it's a little bit dark, but it's, it's I've not changed any names. I might get into trouble for that, I don't know. And I've just told what happened and how, how as a family, we kind of, over COVID and things like you know, Susan and I got very, very close to ending our relationship and actually now we're stronger than we yeah. were before the accident. So it's, I don't know if that's giving you enough context, but it's actually, it sounds really, really for me, but it's, I think it's good read because it's not, it's, I've tried to keep it in the language that there's a little bit of theory still in there, but, but I tell you the context. Yeah. Because people, you yeah. know, there's grief, grief books have gone back for a very long time, but the first one that in theory was Dr. Kubler Ross. She wrote Death and, Death and Grief, I think. Very cold, and it literally was a technical book. So I've tried to do what she's done, but as a human story. Yeah, you know, there's 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 a little bit of expletives in there, so, but it, it's 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 real. Yeah. You know, to me, it's real. There's no fluffiness. There's no oh, pussy around it. Around it. Around it. Yeah. yeah, and none of that. You know, I won't describe any scenes in that, but it's not it's not graphic. It's just a bit. It's honest. Yeah, and and if you, and, and I've I've put a blog on 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 my blog in preparation for people when I send them PR letter to that could go on and I got a comment from my one of, one of my research one of my team my supervising team 
lady called she's gonna kill me you put yourself on the spot I have put myself on the spot uh, <laughs> Jackie, Jackie, Newton, uh, Jackie Newton Dr Newton she her comment was something like it's beautiful but brutal or or, or something like that right, yeah. yeah and I, but I put it onto the onto the web page onto the blog mm-hmm. so yeah so I'm not saying it's a you know, it's a book for granny. Yeah. None of them are the, the grief ones anyway. But she well might be interested because she chances are she's, you know, lost somebody. But in this case it's a son, you know, and it's it's about anybody who has lost anybody, not just a son. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think that's one thing that I even in my I've never lost a family member. Yeah. Because my grandparents died before I was born, but one maybe when I was like one. Then it's just me, my mum, my dad, my brother. A dog, but obviously a pet's different. Yes, yeah. Um, obviously, it's still sad. Unless you're a child. Yeah, <laughs> it's still sad. I was like, I don't know, twenty two or something. But yeah, I always think like the first person I'm going to lose is my mum and dad. Yeah, and like that's going to hit me hard because I don't have any cousins or anything mm. like that. It's just going to be me and my brother. And then ever so I do always think like it's, it's going to hit me hard. I, I think if you read it. Um, not so bad book, but mm. if you read any of the other books I've said, people like so Julian Barnes lost his wife, who's also an agent, he's a he's a top top writer. C.S. Lewis lost his wife. I've got a lot of you can I should have put this to my things you don't know. <laughs> I've got a whole chapter on Everdem. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, the rapper. the rapper. Yeah. Yes. Because he his best mate called Proof was shot in, in Lightfoot. Yeah. And he wrote a song called Difficult about his, his, his mate getting shot. But I've drawn a comparison with him and C.S. Lewis. Yeah. So, I go. you know, both giants in what they do, mm-hmm. but Eminem was a white, a white working class rapper, yeah. and C.S. Lewis was a lecturer in Oxford or Cambridge. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. But I, I would definitely read, you know, for some insights, I would definitely read some Greek. Hitch is the Hoarded Brain by Helen MacDonald. Yeah. That, that was a, it's a great book about she lost her dad and it's her struggle with that grief. But she, she trained a hawk, a goshawk, to help her through the grief because it, it was a memory of her dad. Because mm. they trained little hawks together and the goshawk was the big sort. See? Yeah. So she trained, she, she took it as part of her grieving process to train the hawk. Because it's honestly some of these. Grief meant more green. Yeah. Uh, back yeah. at Yeah. Well, I always think as well, because my mum and dad just went to a funeral on Monday. It was like one of my mum's relatives. Right. I was find it amazing how my mum, right, her dad died when she was 13, and her mum died when she was 21. Ouch. And she has nobody. But I think, like, and she, she said, like, there was no counselling and no. there wasn't any, like, books or, or whatever. And I was thinking, how oh, the hell? Did you manage? She was with my dad since she was like 16, 17, but I think that's amazing. You know what I mean? It was carrying, she was at uni and she took maybe a week off and then went back to uni and got a degree. And it was that, it's that, it's that resilience, I hope, reflects in the book. Mm-hmm. But I don't know how you do it. I, I, I can't answer that. I don't know how your mum did it. No, no, no. I, I don't know. I don't know how anybody does it. No, crazy. Because this, you know, grief is just, it's, it's part of love. Mm. And unless, you, because you love somebody that much, that's why grief hurts so much. Like you said about a pet, you know, you, it's, it's a pet. And that's why it's more devastating to a kid because, you know, that's what our biggest part of their life. When you're 13, you lose your mum. What? Yeah. That's, she is your life? Yeah. When you're 13? No. It's kind of comprehend it, but. Um, yeah. Well, anyway, right. So. <laughs> so it's not a problem. It's not a problem. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I think I think it's important, though, isn't it? Because like you need to give context to people and yeah, what's shown before and a bit of information. That's the podcast, isn't it? The, yeah. to tell people why you you've yeah. done it. Yeah, and then yeah. and they do it for. But there is light at the end of the tunnel in the book, so it's not. That's what I mean, yeah. You know, it's not cliffhanger. You know, I, it's all good at the end. But obviously, Dom isn't here. Yeah. Ten years, isn't it? Ten years on the fourth, and that's that's why I'm doing on the fourth. Because ten years on the fourth, it's crazy, yeah. So, biggest mistake, or biggest regret? What? What? Saying, I'll give you already mentioned that in the podcast. 
biggest mistake was keeping up writing. It's the biggest regret, keeping up writing. Mm. This is what he kind of touched on these. I mean, strength. I, 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 well, I incorporated the bins. I have to do my job. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I was afraid to do But yeah, no, I, yeah. It, it's, it's, it's just a conversation with them. Yeah, yeah. 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 So. All right, cool. So then, where can people find you, follow you, download the book, get the book, all that kind of stuff? All that kind of stuff. Okay. So, website's uh, ianploftus.com. Is it? And uh, they can read about the book. So, they can, there's a blog on there. The books are on Amazon. If you if you type into the search bar in Amazon, Dr. Ian Loftus, all the books will come up. Don't do it to the fourth because the book isn't on there, but the other books are on there. Mm-hmm. We can launch this on the eighth if you want, a few days after. Or we could do it on the first. It, I no, no pressure. I mean, you know, I'll, it's is this part of the conversation? Well, I can get that in there out. <laughs> I can get that in there out. But it's when, when would you start the week before the week? Probably just do it every Sunday. You see, that's probably it. the following week because okay. it, yeah. you know, if, if any of the PR letters work, so I'm, I'm blitzing Cumbria Liga, yeah. basically. So CFM, BBC, ITV, Portal TV. Quest News, so that'll, that'll, that covers all the local newspapers, come real life. So I'm blitzing all those next week. Mm. You'll yeah. message Sarah. Um, but I think I can kind of think like, say, what you're doing, isn't it? And saying the podcast, if you can help one person from this podcast to get a loop, to get the book and, and that kind of thing, it's one extra person that you haven't helped by not doing what you're doing. Yeah. I think it's, yeah. it's amazing because so many people do what you're doing as well. I think they'd maybe just grieve themselves and just think, but they like see there is to be like the end of the tunnel for you. No, but if you can help however many people, that's, that's a great thing to do to give back. And that's what it's all about. I mean, I'm starting to go to charity, so if I make any profit, it's going to go to the charity. It's not about money. Yeah. So I've got a, I've got a cha- charity called Cumbria Night. It's down at the moment because the, the web ladies putting a new uh, temple, uh, yeah, a new design, uh, design on it. Yeah. Yeah. So any any profit of the book, and, and any of the I did books as well, any profit will go to that 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 charity. But I'm splitting the the new book probably with Cumberland Lard and Compassionate Friends. Okay. Which is a grief charity down south. And they support they mainly support parents who've lost a child. And um, they've supported a lot of writers who've written about grief. So I'm hoping, even hopefully, the book will be on their, on their library anyway. It's done an extensive library about grief. So I'll split any profit with Cumberland Lad and Compassionate Friends. Yeah, that's cool, cool. Any closing so- thoughts, any final thoughts you want to mention on the podcast? Anybody? <sighs> yeah, it's a jungle out there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know. It's it's a funny one because we've we've talked about business, but then we've been talking about my new business, which is I know you're trying to aim at business people. It's just, it's just me just telling your story, you know. I mean, and if you can promote your your newest book, and then people can relate to you. We've got we've got a guest. We got an unexpected guest. <laughs> I'm Bobby in the corner. But yeah, just like whatever you know. I mean, cause it's a mixture of. People get to know you for you, you know what I mean? So you and that, like I was saying to you, it's it humanises you because people may know you from the restaurants and the hotels and that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. They may know you as the author and it's just like what you're seeing younger, younger and that kind of thing. And I suppose the, the biggest message, if, if I'm going to leave a message, is, you know, we are, as, as a species, we are resilient and, yeah. and a lot of people do just give up. And as a business owner, as a writer, as a person, you have to be resilient and you've got to, you've got to keep going. Yeah. No matter what life throws at you. Yeah. Or, I think that's great advice to be fair, isn't it? Because I think people think it's easy, don't they? You've just got to get up, do the same thing over and over again, and then hope that the next day is better, even next day better, and just trust the process, I guess. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you bring, if I've gone back to grief, your brain works it out. And, but you've, you've got to help your brain do it. And you've got to, you know, I, my, my thesis was about the role of, this, this is Katie, little dashing. <laughs> the, 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 my thesis was about how to use creative and self-expressive writing as a therapy to get you through grief. 
Okay. And it's a well-known, particularly in the US, it's a well-known therapy. You know, there's a body, a, a medical body in the US that supports people who didn't want that therapy. Not in the UK. Oh, maybe that's something you could say. Right. Well, I've already, there's a lady called Susie Orbach, actually. She's a, a psychotherapist. She was Princess Diana's psychotherapist. Oh, really? I'll have you know. But that's interesting. So I, I, I did send the pieces to her a, a while ago, but I just need to update it. And she has started to use creative writing. Um, I almost mentioned Max Porter before. He wrote a book called Grief is a Thing with Feathers. And she, Susie sent Max one of the clients to do writing exercises with. And Max has read my thesis and Max is, well, I know Max, you know, we've, I met him through uni. So it is starting to become creative writing or something expressive writing is starting to be recognised now in the UK as a, as a therapy. Yeah. As a therapy for grief. So, yeah. So, that'd be interesting. Yeah. See yeah. so, how yeah. that pans out because that'll be, that'll be really cool, I think. Definitely. I'll definitely be behind it 100 million percent hit. But it's, it's, it's somebody like Sue Yorba, really. She is the best psychotherapist in you know, Princess Diana's therapist. She's one of the best in the game. Yeah. So it needs somebody like her. And she's already started to do it with Max, but there has to be a process. There has to be a theory behind it. Yeah. And I've done the theory and I've given it to her. So watch this face. Yeah, definitely. Right, everybody, if you are watching on YouTube, make sure to subscribe, like the video, comment your favorite part, any questions, Ian, leave them in the comment section below. If you're listening on Spotify, Apple, make sure to follow the podcast and leave a five-star review, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.